Okay, so we're on Mark chapter 15 today. Uh, I assume we're going to finish the Gospel of Mark today, and we'll talk about where we're going after that. But uh, as we get rolling again, I just want to remind you of what we began with last week. Just, just think a little bit about who this is we're talking about, because I don't want to uh, give you any spoilers today, but someone's going to be crucified in the Gospel that we're reading from today. You'll never guess who. You all know that, right? And we talk about it so much that it can be something we just let sort of slip off our tongue. Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross. Stop and think about this. This is God in the flesh. Just let that sink in for a minute. The one who is above all time and space. He created all time and space. The, the king who needs absolutely nothing, who's now resolutely, willingly going to the cross for you and for me. And it's worth just stopping and thinking about that. When you stop and consider how, how resolute he is compared with our level of conviction, you know, where we're often ready to give the crumbs and the leftovers and the extras, there he is giving everything. The disciples flee, Peter denies him, he's mocked and he's ridiculed. The, the ones who should have been the leaders in pointing people toward him are calling up every lie in the book to betray him to death. He's going to be beaten within an inch of his life before he's crucified. And sometimes I'm ready to give him the crumbs that fall off the edge of my table. And that's really kind of a sobering thought. Uh, so today, let's just sort of keep in mind as we go through this, the contrast. The, the human characters who are here. Uh, the priests are, are hypocritical. It would seem to us almost beyond belief until you realize how we can be very much the same way. Uh, they treat the, the religious uh, laws and ordinances in such a superficial way. Uh, you know, they, they're like the people in uh, Amos chapter 8. You know, when's the Sabbath going to be over so we can get back to making a living and, and, uh, making a, or, and using dishonest scales? When will the new moon festival be done so we can get back to real life? You know, when's the pastor going to stop preaching or we'll be the last ones at the restaurant for lunch? Uh, you know, we can treat things in a very superficial way sometimes as well. Um, the other characters, there's Pilate who knows Jesus is innocent, but he's going to do what's politically safe and put him to death or have him put to death anyway. Uh, there is uh, Joseph of, of, um, of Arimathea, uh, part of the ruling council, the Sanhedrin, that he had Jesus put to death unjustly. And, and yet Joseph has his doubts. And, and in his mind, he, he, he's wondering if this, this isn't the one, the promised Messiah. And he's even there ready to bury his body later on and honor him in that way. But, well, maybe he did speak up sooner. We don't know. I guess I better give him the benefit of the doubt. But he's part of the group at any rate that has Jesus put to death. There's Peter, I'll never deny you. And yet we all know what happened. We read about it last week, uh, or a couple of weeks ago. Denied him three times before the rooster crowed once. And in the middle of all that, there's Jesus. Strengthened by the Father through his prayer in Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Strengthened by the Father and resolutely making his way to the cross for you and me. It's a beautiful picture that we read today. And, and as we go through it, we'll try and break it down a little bit and, and point out a few things. But don't lose sight of the big picture, the contrast between how we are and how faithful the living Lord is. Okay? Yep, go ahead. Absolutely right. The, the comment was, you know, the physical abuse, yes, was horrific. But what the real weight was, was the weight of our sins and suffering 
hell itself, having the Father turn his face away from him. And we'll talk about that when we get to that section in the Gospels today. The other thing that I'll point out there, but I'll give you a heads up now so we've heard it at least twice, is never lose sight of the fact that the Bible is very clear that when Jesus died, he gave up his spirit. Pilate was surprised he was already dead. And we read that today as well. He willingly gave up his spirit as part of what was happening for you and me. And that's part of him, like I said, resolutely setting his face and doing what needed to be done so people like us could have hope, life, and salvation. Yeah. Yeah. He had control over every step of the way. And again, never lose sight of the fact that it was prophesied. And we'll touch on that today as well. We haven't even opened with prayer yet, so let's do that, okay? Uh, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, and we pray that today as we gather around your word and, and read the account of Jesus' death so long ago, that we will see in it your love for each one of us and your faithfulness. We rely upon that, we build our lives upon that, we celebrate that, and we thank you for that. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we left off with Peter having denied him and the rooster crowing and and then noted as well how uh, it's reported in the other Gospels that Jesus looked at Peter at that point and Peter broke down and wept and how beautifully, as John reports in John 20, after the resurrection, how beautifully Jesus restored Peter again. He, He really wants to follow through on that prayer that he gave Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed that you would remain faithful and strong. And Jesus follows through on helping Peter do just that. At any rate, getting back to where we left off, beginning of chapter 15, it's now very early in the morning. The chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, that's an important thing, the whole Sanhedrin, so that would include Joseph of Arimathea, reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Now, a couple of things here. They've already had their mock trial in the middle of the night. And we noted last time how uh, capital trials required by their own Jewish law at least two hearings that had to be at least one day apart. Uh, They had two hearings, one right after the other, in the middle of the night uh, with false witnesses whose stories couldn't match up and yet it moved on to, to Jesus' death anyway. You know, so just, it's kind of mind-boggling what a railroad job this really was. Um, and now they're, they're going to meet again very early in the morning as if they're trying to lend some legitimacy to all that went on during the night. You know, they're trying to say, okay, here in the light of day, we, we've had a few hours now where we're pulling back and, and cooler heads can prevail. Now we're going to have another run at it. It's still not meeting their own requirements, but they're trying to lend some legitimacy to it. So they handed him over to Pilate. Now, is Pilate going to care if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God? Not too much. So the charges they're going to bring before Jesus, the charges that they're going to accuse him of before Pilate are things like subverting the nation. How did Jesus do that? He didn't. You know, he healed sick people. He brought others back to life. He, he taught people to be meek and loving and caring. Not too much subverting the nation going on there. So a false charge. He was accused of, of saying people should not pay taxes to Caesar. He didn't do that. He said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what is God's. And that's a powerful statement. You know, the image of Caesar was on the coin. So if Caesar's image is on the coin, give it to Caesar. Where's God's image? It's printed on every human heart. So give that to God was Jesus teaching. But he never said, don't pay taxes to Caesar. Uh, He claimed kingship. But Jesus himself said to Pilate, my kingdom's not of this world. Uh, so, you know, they're all false charges, but the only ones that the, um, the chief priests and the ruling council are going to bring to Pilate to accuse Jesus are any charges that might sound political in some way or another, okay? Uh, so Pilate responds, are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. Uh, and the NIV, I'm sorry to say, really butchers Jesus' reply. Uh, the NIV reads, yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied, really, really bad translation, Very literally, it's, you say so. So it's like Jesus is being kind of enigmatic and and throwing Pilate's question back at him. Is that what you think? You know, you say so is literally what Jesus says. 
the chief priests accused him of many things. Again, all the political charges. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. Uh, you know, they're, they're trying to stir up the people again with all the political questions, but, or political accusations rather. But Jesus still made no reply and Pilate was amazed. The, world, the word means impressed. Pilate had a sense of admiration about him. Who is this man, he was saying. Now, I want to pause here for a second because I intended to do this and I forgot. Uh, people sometimes go through the four different Gospels uh, and they, they start to think, well, I thought this happened here and that happened there and, and are things in the wrong order? Now, remember, uh, when Mark writes, for instance, he's writing with a goal. He's writing for a Gentile audience, so he explains a lot of the Jewish things that are happening or Jewish vocabulary sometimes. Uh, and he is also kind of cherry picking events and he doesn't always put them in the chronological order they happened. He's putting them in a, uh, he's tying them together uh, because of trains of thought and teaching. So if Jesus taught something about this particular thing here on this day and on another day, he taught very similar things. Mark sometimes brings them together. So there's no contradiction. So let me just lay out for you. There's a couple of scholars way smarter than me who've, who've done this. Uh, and here's taking events from all four of the Gospels. Here's generally what happened on Resurrection Day. Um, and we're going to be coming to that in a minute. So I wanted to just do it as we, we begin today. So early in the morning after the Sabbath, Jesus rose from the dead, passed through his burial wrappings and out of the tomb without disturbing anything. Remember, they found the, the headpiece, especially just exactly as it was, the linens as they were, as they wrapped him. Uh, to announce the resurrection, the Father in heaven then sent an angel and shook the very area with an earthquake. The angel rolled the stone away from the entrance of the tomb to show that it was empty. The guards, paralyzed by fear, fled from the scene and were later paid off by the Jewish ruling council. Okay, so everything's kind of happening in chronological order. It was then that the women came and wondered who would roll the stone door. Seeing it lying flat on the ground and the tomb open, Mary Magdalene ran ahead, glanced into the tomb, and immediately ran back to town to inform the disciples. In the meantime, the other women entered the tomb and were told by the angel that Jesus had risen. They were also told to go and tell his disciples, especially Peter. We'll read about that today. Now Mary Magdalene was returning to the tomb accompanied by Peter and John. She remember, she had run to town to tell them. Now she's coming back with Peter and John. Uh, when on the way, they met the other women. Peter and John ran ahead. After viewing the empty tomb and seeing the burial linens, they returned to Jerusalem. Mary Magdalene again came to the tomb where angels spoke to her, and that's when Jesus, the risen Lord, appeared to her, and she was crying and didn't recognize him at first and all. Uh, shortly thereafter, Jesus also appeared to the other women who were still on their way back to Jerusalem. So, you know, everything falls into place, uh, and, and there's a strict and, and non-contradictory chronology going on. Uh, sometime late in the morning or early afternoon of Easter, Jesus appeared to Peter, who certainly needed that assurance, Later that afternoon, two disciples met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. On Easter in the evening, Jesus appeared to the ten apostles. Thomas was missing uh, when they were in the locked room. And a week later, Jesus appeared to the eleven under the same circumstances. They had discussed everything that had happened, but it took them a long time to grasp the glorious truth. And that's why Jesus remained among them for 40 days and met with them in Galilee, away from his enemies, before returning to Bethany for the ascension. So, you know, there's no contradictions. So if Mark reports sometimes things in a different order, he's doing it to tie ideas together so that his Gentile readers can understand. But you know, the Gospels are, are very, very clear and do not contradict each other. Just wanted to throw that in there. That's something that, that people often claim. All right, so back to where we were in Mark chapter 15. Uh, Jesus has said to Pilate, it is, uh, you say that I am, and, and the chief priests continue to uh, accuse him, and Pilate is amazed. And then verse 6, now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. Okay, so if Barabbas is one of the insurrectionists, what has Barabbas been doing? Don't say insurrection. He has been trying to overthrow the Roman government, right? Isn't that exactly what the chief priests and the ruling council are accusing Jesus of before Pilate? 
And yet they are going to say, hey, release Barabbas, who has been convicted of this crime, and it's clear that he's done it, and instead crucify Jesus, who we made up a bunch of things about. It's, I'm sorry? Well, yeah, it is there too, isn't it? Yeah, and the... <laughs> yeah, it does confuse the issue too, uh, that Barabbas also bears the name uh, Jesus as part of his name, not recorded in Mark, but elsewhere um, in the other Gospels. So, you know, again, it, it just goes to how devious the sinful human nature is. Like, just... Oh, that's a good point. They weren't frightened of Barabbas, but they were frightened of Jesus. Why? Because if he keeps on doing what he's doing, we will lose our position and our power. They were frightened for very superficial reasons. The day will come when they'll be frightened for a bigger reason, right? Uh, and that's a sad thing if they didn't turn from that, that uh, false belief. But it, it just goes to, and I'm dwelling on this for a reason. I want to make a connection for us today. It goes to how superficial we can be as human beings. And even as people who are gathered here around the Word of God or watching this later and in gathering over your scriptures, even we can be susceptible to that um, and, and get to the point where we're giving God our leftovers. You know, if, if there's a few crumbs left over, here it is, Lord. You know, again, these people couldn't wait for the Sabbath to be over so they could set up their bazaar and start making money again. Um, we're in a day and an age where regular worship now means about once a month. Statistically. Those who claim they worship regularly, on average, go once a month. I think we're in a day and an age, like we've said before, and I, I love this description, in the Western world, the Christian community is about 16,000 miles wide and about an eighth of an inch deep. And that's why it's so important that we're doing what we're doing here and now. And taking this very familiar historical account and reminding ourselves of what it truly means so that the next time I'm tempted to say, okay, Lord, I got to do me today, you'll get the leftovers. I stop and think about who it is I'm saying that to. And when I deeply consider that, then I'm enabled to come to him with things that are important and deep and go away from my time with him encouraged and uplifted because what he says and does is real and true. Okay? Um, all right. The sermon ends here. Back to the text. So Barabbas, the very, uh, the very one who was an insurrectionist, is, is the one they're going to ask to be released. Uh, that's where we pick up in verse 9. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. And in John, it's even reported in John chapter 19 that the chief priests and the ruling council said, we have no king but Caesar. Can you just imagine that? The leaders of the church saying they have no king but Caesar. Wow. Uh, again, it just goes to show how, how important it is that we, uh, as Hebrews puts it, don't get carried along by the current of the day. And we remain vigilant and, and sober-minded uh, and, and focused upon the truth of who we are in God's creation. Now, it was by this point that... Uh, uh, the other Gospels report that Pilate's wife had that dream, remember? And she sent word to Pilate, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Uh, and that made Pilate even more nervous. And he ended up washing his hands of the whole matter publicly. And that's where that expression comes from. Uh, all of that, Mark leaves out. His report is much briefer than many of the others. Uh, but uh, we'll try and fill in some details along the way. All right, uh, verse 12, what shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Now, Pilate's the judge, right? What kind of judge says to the accusing party, what should I do with the one you're accusing? What kind of judge does that? You know, so he's abdicating his responsibility 
well, you know, politician, right? he's, he's being, and I don't mean that in a totally negative way, he's being political, let me put it that way. Uh, he's protecting his own skin here, is a better way of saying it. He presses the issue a little bit, why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But do they answer that question? No, they just shouted all the louder, crucify him. There's no answer, there can be no legitimate answer, because this is Jesus resolutely, by his own choice, going to the cross that we would have life. Don't ever lose sight of that fact. And imagine, like, like the lyric of the song says, the king in need of nothing chooses to give up everything so that you could have hope and a future and not just be a little blip on the timeline of eternity, but could be with him forever. That is really remarkable to stop and consider. Um, also remarkable is the fact that who's the only person actually defending Jesus in any way here? Pilate. He's the only one who's even trying, isn't he? And that's kind of remarkable. All right, so 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And, and, you know, the other Gospels, again, fill in a lot more information. Uh, Pilate wanted to try and elicit some sympathy from the crowd by having Jesus flogged and, and then marching him out again after the soldiers mock him in the section that follows. An interesting thing here, though, was there seemed to be no limit to the flogging. And what I mean by that is whenever we hear, for instance, of Paul being flogged by the Romans, it was always the 40 lashes minus one. I don't know why they didn't just call it the 39 lashes, but it was called the 40 lashes minus one. Because if you got to 40, by that point, everyone was dead. 39, you might survive, okay? Uh, and the, it was a vicious thing with, with leather whips, with bits of sharp metal and rock and, and pottery tied to the ends of them so it would shred your back. Jesus, I'm, I'm not trying to be morbid or, or gross or anything here. He would have lost a lot of blood as he was flogged. And the only reason I'm pointing that out again is to say this. This is the creator of all things allowing his creation to do this to him. That's stunning. That's just stunning, isn't it? That he would allow that to happen. But again, as he prayed in the garden to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. And, and that was done so that we, his church, could echo that statement now. And that's where I'm really going with it. That, that we wouldn't just give him the crumbs or the leftovers, but we would echo that statement and say in our lives, not my will, but yours be done too. Um, all right, so he handed him over to be crucified. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, uh, the seat of Roman power, and called together the whole company of soldiers. So you have got a lot of soldiers here, uh, likely in the hundreds, okay? Uh, and just imagine the, I'll put it in air quotes, fun they were going to have with this prisoner. Hmm. They put a purple robe on him, probably one of their worn out garments, then wove a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, hail king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Now, stop. And, and don't read over it too quickly. Just let that wash around in your head a little bit and try and picture it a little. Uh, not too long, not too much. Again, I don't want to be morbid or anything this afternoon, but, but don't read it too quickly. This is the creator. Remember what happened when they came to arrest him and he said, I'm the one you're looking for. What happened to those soldiers? The hundreds of soldiers they brought to arrest him. Just get that image in your mind. Hundreds of soldiers fell face to the ground. They couldn't help it. He's letting them do this to him. He's letting them. These things must happen. Jesus had foretold back in Mark 10. The Son of Man will be turned over uh, to the chief priests, the rulers, and the teachers of the law, and the Gentiles will whip him and flog him and put him to death. And here it is taking place. And it's not just that Jesus knew ahead of time, it's that he knew ahead of time and walked eyes open into it. Okay. This is the measure of our Savior's commitment to us. So let me just throw one thing into the mix and then we'll go on. 
with that kind, with a savior who shows that kind of commitment, how dare I say, think, or feel, God, have you forgotten about me now? You know, I'm just going to say that with a smile on my face because God knows our hearts and in his mercy and grace, he keeps pouring grace upon grace out upon us anyway. But I need to ask myself that question once in a while. How dare I say or think things like that? How dare I not live in his hope, peace, and joy from day to day, even before I have my coffee in the morning? How dare I? And it's just, it's really worth stopping and thinking about these climactic events in the history of the world that we talk about so often, we sometimes just sort of gloss over what's really going on here. So again and again they struck him, it says in verse 19, uh, and then falling on their knees, NIV has they worshiped him. That's going a little too far, they knelt down. You know, obviously it's false worship, right? So they, they just knelt before him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Uh, a certain man from Cyrene, that would be what we think of as Libya, or uh, yeah, Libya, uh, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now, he was in Jerusalem for the, the festival, for the Sabbath, no doubt, uh, and he's named here, and, and the, the ultimate um, implication is, Go ask him. He obviously reported this to the, the apostles and to Mark. Go ask him. Make sure that this was true. And let me add to that as well. Uh, Rufus, at least, was named uh, in the end, near the end of the book of Romans by Paul as, as someone that he was sending greetings to. So these were clearly people who had shifted from Old Testament hope to New Testament believers in Christ. And the implication is, go and ask them. They can tell you what happened and that it's true. So he uh, carried Jesus' cross. Um, wouldn't that have been an amazing thing to be able to say, too, if you were uh, uh, Rufus or Alexander? Yeah, you know, my dad was there. Jesus really did this. My dad was there, and, and he even carried that cross. Um, kind of sad in a way that he had to carry the instrument of his Savior's death, but kind of beautiful in a way that he was allowed to be a part of the process of Jesus' commitment to him and to you and to me. Um, all right, 22, they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, another one of Mark's uh, explanations for the Gentile reader. Don't know if it was called the place of the skull because that's where a lot of crucifixions took place or if that was the shape of the hill. Maybe both, uh, we're really not sure, but that's what it was called. Uh, then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Later on, Jesus does accept the sour wine after everything is completed and right before he gives up his spirit. But here he refuses it. Uh, myrrh was kind of a narcotic, a painkiller given to people. And so he refuses it there. He's going to face this head on and face it alone. Uh, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. Again, fulfillment of prophecy. The Psalms talk about that. They cast lots for my clothing. It was the third hour when they crucified him, about nine in the morning by our uh, timekeeping. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Uh, and remember... The, that Pilate was challenged, the other Gospels report, just say he said he was the king of the Jews. Come on, don't write that. And Pilate replies, what I've written, I was written. Pilate knew this trial was a sham. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. Yes, he did try and defend him a bit, but ultimately he caved as well. So this is kind of, you know, Pilate's uh, parting shot, I guess, towards those he, he knew were cornering him into doing something he did not want to do. Uh, and then 27, they crucified two robbers with him, also fulfilling prophecy, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by, says, hurled insults, literally blasphemed. That's the word that's used there. They blasphemed at him, and that's an appropriate word to use when you understand what's really happening here, isn't it? 
this is the living God himself, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And we'll see here a couple of times in very short order, the, the natural human default position is look out for me. Their natural assumption is he'd want to save himself. And we'll see it again, just a few verses. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Now, stop and think again. You know, first, you've got that same human default position. I look out for me first, okay? But you also have their statement, he saved others. You realize they never denied Jesus did miracles, right? They never denied it because they couldn't. He raised people from the dead and he uh, raised Lazarus from the dead and, and then Lazarus was in trouble. They wanted to make a plot and did make a plot to kill him too. Uh, he, he healed people that nobody could heal. He cast out people or demons from people who were possessed. Uh, he did things that they could not do and they couldn't deny it. And yet here they are taking this remarkable man and having him executed for no reason other than their own self-interest. We will lose our position and our power because the whole world will follow after him. Um, it, it's something that is just such a clear picture of the impact of sin on human beings. All right, um, let's see. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Verse 32, let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Would they have? I don't think so. But what would have happened if Jesus had come down from the cross? Of course, the whole plan of salvation is thwarted, right? So let's take that phrase that they used, that they that we may see and believe, and, and let's apply it to us. What do we see on that cross? Just what we've been talking about all day so far. The living God, the king in need of nothing, the one who called time and space and everything into being, the one who breathed life into the first human being and Adam became a living being. We see that individual willingly going to the cross Let's see that and believe. You see what I'm saying? Let's see how God really acts. Let's get a glimpse of God's character in this statement. He stayed on the cross so that we can see and believe. That's where you see what greatness is like. Uh, Jesus once taught in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, uh, they will inherit the earth. And, and we kind of read that and go, I don't know, meek sounds like a kind of a negative thing in our culture, doesn't it? Well. Don't ever equate me meek with weak. Meekness is power under control. And that's what we see with Jesus on the cross. We see real power under real control. See that and believe. You get a glimpse of what God is like when you really think about what's going on with Jesus willingly staying on that cross. Uh, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Mark doesn't touch on it, but remember how one of those thieves called, <laughs> thieves? Yeah, thieves. How one of them called on Jesus' mercy. Remember that? And what was Jesus' reply to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise, right? Uh, and, and another beautiful picture of how it really is for all of us. You know, could that thief get down from the cross and go into the foreign mission field and earn his way into heaven? No. All he could do is throw himself on God's mercy. And, and that's why, like I've said many times, I think it's in the baptism of a helpless infant, bringing that child into the kingdom, that we get one of the clearest pictures of how God deals with us as adults every day. You know, we're like that thief on the cross. Throw yourself on God's mercy. He'll catch you. He's there. Uh, we've seen the picture of what God is like back at that, in that phrase that we may see and believe and see him on the cross. You can be sure he'll catch you. All right, um, going on, we see the death of Jesus and the verses that follow, and we see a number of things taken, taking place here. There are supernatural events taking place that are signals to you and me. Uh, at the sixth hour, so it's around noon now, Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. 
Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. So noon until 3 p.m., darkness comes over the whole land. This is not a solar eclipse. This is not anything natural. This is a supernatural darkness like happened in Egypt when God proclaimed judgment over Pharaoh and the kingdom there. And remember how at that time, the land of Goshen where the Israelites were was still in light? Remarkable, supernatural. Well, how can that be? Well, you know, the one who created the laws of nature and physics and everything else, he has the ability to circumvent them when he wants to. Uh, he knows how they work, he made them. Uh, and so he creates a supernatural darkness here. And the question is why? What's happening during these three hours? Judgment. But who's taking the judgment? Jesus. And the weight of everything in the history of the world, every human being who ever lived, is living, or will live all of our tomorrows in that time period is resting on the Savior. And that's why we see at the ninth hour, where it reaches the climax, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and I want to come back to that, Eloi Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22 there. It's another prophecy being fulfilled. But the only place to be totally forsaken by God is hell. Uh, the only place where God is not. And that is the true essence of hell. You know, people talk about heaven as being up and hell as being down. I mean, that's just our way of imagining things figuratively. It, it, where is heaven? Well, it's not in this sin-impacted creation, right? Or it wouldn't be perfect. So it's not anywhere out there that you can put in space and time. It's beyond space and time. And when the new heavens and the new earth come and the first heavens and the first earth are destroyed, well, then, then it becomes our reality too, or if we die before that and are taken there ahead of time. But uh, here is the only place where God is not, hell. That's the essence of hell, okay? So when Jesus cries out this way, that's what he's suffering for you and me. And notice how he cries. It's still my God. He doesn't deny the Father, right? He doesn't separate himself. He still claims relationally, you are my God. We were made to be together. Why have you forsaken me? And by the way, is it because Jesus doesn't know? Of course not. He knows the answer to the question. That's why he's there. He predicted it. He foretold it. But he's making the statement in fulfillment of prophecy and so that it's clear to us what's going on. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out is Jesus did this crying out in a loud voice. And the Gospels say that specifically. When he's about to die, it's going to happen in the next couple of verses. When you died by crucifixion, you died by asphyxiation. You suffocated. And at the point of death, you were no longer able to get a whisper out, let alone a loud cry. It's all making the point that Jesus is willingly doing this, willingly giving up his life, willingly suffering hell for you and me. Okay, so he says this loudly. Um, when some of those, verse 35, standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. And it's kind of a, 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 it's kind of a silly pun. They're kind of making fun of him still. Eloi, Eloi, Elijah, it sounds similar in Hebrew, even more so than it does in English. Uh, pardon me. So they're making a bit of a silly pun and still mocking him. Uh, one man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, sour wine, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. And this time Jesus accepted it a little bit. Um, Leave him alone now. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said, why did Jesus accept it now? The price has been paid. Um, the other gospels report the phrase, it is finished. Uh, an accounting term from their day, paid in full. You know, so the, the price for everything has been paid. And then verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Matthew and John put it more clearly, he gave up his spirit. No one took it from him. He was still crying out in a loud voice. He did not suffocate as you would when you died of crucifixion. He gave up his spirit, his life, willingly for you and me. Now, here's an interesting thing. We confess, when we confess, for instance, in the Apostles' Creed, 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again, right? Picture Jesus' life as a state, the, you know, the theological terms are the state of humiliation and the state of exaltation. The state of humiliation is Jesus, God in the flesh, willingly choosing to give up things he had a right to claim, claim rather, to fully identify with us as human beings. That takes him all the way down from birth to you know, growing, to living as we should have, to, to being hungry as we are, to needing sleep and rest as we do, to his trial and to his crucifixion, and all the way down to, uh, all the, way down to the point where he suffers hell. Okay? Now, it's interesting, I think, to note that his death is considered the first step in returning to his exalted state. Just think about that for a minute. What's one of the first things the Bible says Jesus did? And it's an obscure passage that people wonder about, and that's why I'm bringing it up. As he died, he also went and preached to the souls in prison. What did Jesus go and do? He went to proclaim his victory. He went to proclaim to everyone who died without faith in the coming Messiah that the coming Messiah was now here. And he didn't do that in a vengeful, nah, nah, I told you so kind of way. He did that in the same proclamation of victory manner in which we'll see him come at the end of all time. And every knee will bow before him. And so this is now part of Jesus' victory dance already. Uh, you know, and, and so he willingly gives up his spirit because the job of winning our forgiveness is complete. That's the point I'm trying to make, all right? Uh, so uh, let's see, where do we leave off here? Uh, verse uh, 38. At that point, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So the first supernatural thing was the darkness. The second one is the temple curtain being torn in two from top to, go to bottom. These are not sheer drapes that you have over your living room window. This is a thick, thick, heavy, I, I forget how tall, 30 foot tall curtain. That, that it would take many human beings to actually tear in half. You know, one person couldn't do it. And it just did it by itself, automatically, from top to bottom. What's the signal? Well, you know what it is. What did the temple separate? God's presence in the holy place from everyone else. And God's presence in the holy place and everyone else are no longer separated. Romans 5 says we have access to the Father in this grace in which we now stand. So the separating wall is torn in two from top to bottom, okay? Uh, and, and that's the second supernatural thing we see happening. Mark doesn't report one of the other ones. Uh, remember how the graves of many who had died trusting in the coming Messiah, they, they were raised up and they were seen in Jerusalem and I wonder what they were talking about. Hallelujah, he's come. It's all come to fruition, it's real. All to encourage the believers who are there. Uh, and by the way, the chief priests and teachers of the law couldn't deny that one either, could they? I sometimes do wonder if some of them weren't moved to check into Jesus more carefully after that. I wonder. We'll find out someday in heaven. It just seems mind-boggling that they would see all these things and still all of them totally put up a hardened heart wall. I'm sure a lot of them did but I sometimes wonder if some of them at least weren't brought to see who Jesus really was. And wouldn't it have been humbling and sobering to think that I played a part in having him crucified? How would you have felt if you'd been part of that ruling council and later had come to faith? Wouldn't that be an uncomfortable feeling? Well, let me make you uncomfortable because my life and your life put them there. And that's the reason I raised the point. If you think that person might have been uncomfortable, don't let yourself be the Teflon person and responsibility slides off of you. We all bear that responsibility, don't we? But having said that, I wanna take you back to our discussion uh, of that phrase in verse 32, that we may see and believe. Get that picture of God's character into your head. He did this knowing full well that we don't deserve it. Okay? But that's who he is, and he does not change. 
All right. Um, so the temple's torn in two from top to bottom, 39. And the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. And there's another supernatural thing. When a person comes to faith. Uh, and, and I kind of assume he did because of the way it's presented here. Uh, maybe we'll get to meet him in heaven someday too and, and talk to him a little bit. But the point of it all is, you know, when, when God does break through that hard human heart and bring the gift of who he is back again and brings us back to where we belong in relationship with him, that's an amazing and a supernatural gift. And I want to emphasize that so that you can leave here today or leave from watching online later and you can walk away from this and know that if you believe Jesus is your Savior, don't ever lose sight of the fact that you're not alone. He's made his home supernaturally in you as well. And he will not desert you. Okay, uh, some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Um, Mary Magdalene especially plays quite a role in, in the account of the crucifixion and later in the resurrection. Remember who she was. She was the one who had like seven or eight demons in her and nobody could help her until Jesus came along, until he cast them out. And, and just imagine what life must have been like for her, moving from an existence so horrific into the presence of the living God and now seeing him suffering and dying, but then seeing him alive again. You know, here, uh, here's someone who had ridden the roller coaster of a spiritual life, right? Um, okay, uh, the women are always mentioned. And, you know, for, for that day and age, that was unusual. Uh, but they're always held in very high esteem, and everyone is equivalent, male, female, it doesn't matter in Scripture. Uh, so they're noted here again, verse 42, It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Now, usually it was only a family member who could do that. And we'll see in a minute that Pilate was surprised he was already dead. And, and so Joseph is, is boldly going before Pilate, asking something that he really didn't have a right to claim. So he's taking a chance, and he's taking an extra chance, because who is Joseph? He's part of the ruling council that just had Jesus put to death. Now, whether he spoke up in those mock trials or not, we're not told. If it was, was he too afraid to say anything? We don't know. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, he probably tried, but it was an uphill battle and he lost. So I'll, I'll try and give him the benefit of the doubt. That's what I'd want someone to do for me. Uh, but at the same time, now he's going public. And now he's going to risk his And maybe they're going to be after him now too. But he's going to do it. So there's a shift that's happened in Joseph's life, right? After everything he's witnessed and seen, there's a shift. Uh, we learn also from the Gospel of John that Nicodemus went with him. Nicodemus was also a member of the ruling council and was afraid, so he went to talk to Jesus at night. They, they are both now going public with this. And, and that's really something that marks the Christian life too. Uh, am I willing to confess this publicly? It should never be a secret, right? Uh, and, and so this, this is kind of a significant thing for them. Um, Pilate was, in verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, the fellow we mentioned earlier, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. And remember how uh, the other uh, soldier had plunged the spear into Jesus' side? That's reported in John. Uh, they went to break the legs of the other, uh, of all three of them. They broke the legs of the other two, but saw that Jesus was already dead because they wanted to get them off the cross before the Sabbath. You know, you can't have any of this, this dirty, um, you know, criminal business and false accusation and mock trial stuff going on on the Sabbath day, can you? It's okay on other days, but not on Sabbath. Uh, and, you know, are we that different? Um, I, I have had asked of me over the years, and I've asked other people over the years, would you be thinking that way? Would you be acting that way? Would you be doing that? Would you be speaking that way if Jesus were here? 
And the obvious response is, well, he is, right? So why am I doing that? Uh, and, and, you know, it just, again, shows the, the sinful human nature and how it, it impacts us so deeply. So at any rate, uh, he learns uh, Jesus is dead, gives the body to Joseph and Nicodemus, as John reports. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Now, this is a quick attempt at honoring someone they cared about and wanted to honor before the Sabbath. Because once the Sabbath comes, you can't work. Um, and, and I'm not trying to make fun of them when I say that. They were honestly trying to honor him and still obey the Sabbath law, which was important to them because it was important to God. And they hadn't yet grasped what was really going on here. And can you blame them? Because they know that dead is dead. And we know that dead is dead. So they're doing a, sort of a quick embalming, a quick ceremony. And the ladies will come on Easter morning to complete it. Uh, then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And going on then, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. So they were going to complete, complete the process. Uh, and, you know, it's not a major point, but just for clarity, there's a difference in, in what they're talking, or in the vocabulary of what's talked about here. Uh, Joseph brought the linen, wrapped it in the linen, placed it in a tomb, and the other Gospels report that he had put some, um, some fragrant things in there, and sort of sprinkled in, in the linen as they wrapped him up. But now the ladies were coming with what was called aromata, and that's liquid perfume. And they were going to unwrap it, have all the, the stuff sprinkled in there, kept in there to be wrapped up again, but now anoint Jesus' entire body uh, with the perfume as well to complete the process and, and honor the one they loved. So they went, uh, verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But of course, the angel had already uh, appeared and rolled it away and the earth had shaken and the guards had fled. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, singled out, because he's going to need it, right? Uh, so there's always compassion shown for the individual. Tell them he is going ahead of you into Galilee, which is just what he said he would do back in uh, the earlier chapters of Mark. There you will see him just as he told you. Mark chapter 14 reports that. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And you probably have a note there that if you have an NIV Bible, it'll say something to the effect of the two most reliable early manuscripts do not have the remainder. Uh, the NIV really overstates the case when it says that. Uh, the vast majority of the manuscripts have the rest of the Gospel of Mark. Is it a big deal either way? No. Uh, just, just two out of the vast pile of manuscript evidence don't include it. And uh, why? I don't know. But the vast majority do. And so I think a, a better statement would be just, yeah, a couple. The majority, however, include the rest if the last little bit was not included in Mark's original. Why would that be? It's kind of an abrupt ending, isn't it? And if Mark ended it that abruptly, I think it would be kind of an enticement for someone to say, what next? And find out more. You know, it's kind of like when you're watching your favorite TV series and they get to the season ender, what do they always end on? Some kind of cliffhanger, right? So they keep you dangling until they start up for whenever the next season begins. And maybe that's what Mark is trying to do if he does end it there. But personally, I don't think that's the end of the gospel. I have always tended to include the rest as original. If it wasn't, is there anything in the rest that is new or obscure or that isn't supported elsewhere in the Bible? No. It's all stuff that, that the other gospels report. So it's really not a big deal either way. But I don't see any reason to exclude it just because two out of the preponderance of of manuscripts don't have it included. Anyway, you can take that for what it's worth. The rest, however, reads, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. 
uh, she went and told those who had been with him who were mourning and weeping. So she had run back. Uh, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country, the road to Emmaus and the two disciples there. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. You know, Resurrection Day was a busy day for Jesus. He was appearing here, there, and everywhere, wasn't he? Yeah. Okay, uh, the comment is that um, it says, uh, verse 7, he's going ahead of you, there you will see him in Galilee, just as he told you. Okay, so first of all, that's a reminder of what Jesus said in Mark 14, that they will see him there, and for 40 days he'll be teaching them there, away from the center of, of controversy in Jerusalem. So they can have private teaching time for 40 days until he returns to uh, the area for the ascension. Okay, um, but they already saw him, so didn't the angel tell an untruth? I don't want to say the angel lied. <laughs> didn't the angel say something that was false? Well, no, um, you know, they're going to see him there. It doesn't mean that's the first time they'll see him, but they are going to see him there just as he said ahead of time is the idea. So the angel isn't really saying you won't see him until then. He's just saying that prophecy will be fulfilled and, and you will, um, the action there is continuous. There you will continue to be with him just as he told you, okay? So it's more of a continuous action visit there as opposed to a little short visit on the road to Emmaus or wherever. All right, so the disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, they returned, uh, they weren't believed either. Verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. Remember the upper locked room? Uh, he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And by the way, when I say the 11 in the upper locked room, that's the second time, right? Because the first time it was the 10 because Thomas wasn't there. Uh, so, you know, Mark doesn't include all the details, but he's uh, following the, the general theme of the story for the sake of his Gentile readers. He said to them, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Uh, and that's kind of an important statement. You know, baptism isn't the hoop you jump through to get into heaven. Faith is the issue. Do you think there are people who have been baptized and who have renounced that faith by their life? Sure. Baptism's not a hoop you jump through and you don't have God where you want him. Um, but it, it is a sign of faith. It's something we do because God has said, this is important to do and this is where the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. And, and so we trust him with that and we act on it. Uh, but it's the faith that's the issue. Uh, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, this is remarkable, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. And, and we've got through the book of Acts, ample examples of people being healed, uh, Paul being bitten by that venomous snake and just throwing it off into the fire and living. Uh, you've got uh, people being raised up again. You've got the Pentecost miracle of speaking in other languages. You know, those were things that, were, uh, that fit into that early church, into the book of Acts. Can God still allow people to do things like that today? Yeah, but that's not the explicit promise. So you shouldn't go out and test God with that. If you see a venomous snake somewhere, don't go and try and pick it up, okay? Uh, that's putting the Lord to the test. If there is a place and a time where something like that is gonna happen to you as a witness to who the Savior is, like it did to Paul, let God worry about that and he'll look after it. But these were especially for that early church to announce to the world who the Savior really is and was. Uh, there is somewhere in the Ozark Mountains, I don't know if they still exist or not, but there was historically in uh, the 20th century, at least, a small group of people who, uh, well, if you wanted to join their church body, you had to pick up a viper. Uh, and if you lived, you were really a believer and you were in. And if you didn't live, well, I guess you weren't really a believer. It's a very small church, and I kind of think it's died out. <laughs> so, you know, taking things like that and putting God to the test is hardly the point either. Ample evidence of those things happening among the apostles in the book of Acts. Uh, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. 
Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So ends Mark's gospel. And you know, it is the most succinct of the gospels, but it again is intended to be an out tool geared toward the Gentile reader. And that's why I think one of the climactic things included in Mark's gospel, which isn't recorded elsewhere, is that centurion saying, surely this man was the son of God. One of the very people putting him to death and seeing that it happened was brought into the kingdom. And what a a wonderful sign that must have been for the non-Jewish believer of that day, right? Um, Okay, so we've come to the end of Mark's gospel. Yep, go ahead. Oh, verse 14? Okay, so verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Yeah, I guess I should have dwelt on that a little more. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, there were many times where Jesus would say things to his disciples. Do you still have no faith? Oh, you of little faith, remember praying in the garden or out on the stormy sea? Uh, Many times where that happened, and this is just another one of them. And it's never something Jesus does in anger. It's a teaching tool. It's a reminder. You know, you're sitting there, disciples, utterly shocked at this as though you couldn't have seen it coming. Well, I told you. Don't you remember? And, and sometimes I've had to have that said to me, sometimes by my wife. Don't you remember I told you to pick that up? <laughs> no. Um, and, and, you know, the point is, it, it's a teaching tool. It's something that that helps you remember next time. And so for the future, going forward from there, would that rebuke ever have been a good thing for them to have experienced? Yeah, because the next time they were tempted to doubt the faithfulness of Jesus as they went out preaching and teaching, they could remember, oh, yeah, you know, I doubted him before and that really didn't turn out very well. Maybe I should trust him now. And it's the same kind of thing that's intended for you and for me today. So never a rebuke in anger. And it is important to note that he rebuked them for their stubborn refusal. And it was an active choice to refuse that. And that becomes even a little more dangerous because, again, it brings to mind, for me at least, what the Gospel of John reports about the chief priests and teachers of the law. They would not believe. You know, they stubbornly refused to believe that this could be. And, and I don't think anyone in this room here today or, or watching this online is going to stubbornly refuse to believe Jesus is the Savior. I don't think that's going to happen if you're watching this or sitting here today. But might we open the door a crack with stubborn, and hearts, stubborn hearts that are moving in the direction of being hardened? Yeah. If I start to think things like, yeah, Jesus will bring me to heaven, but man, he's sure letting me down now. I don't get what he's, he's just not showing up for me now. He's not faithful to me now. That's opening the door a crack. And that's being stubborn. And that's willfully choosing to disregard the truth of scripture. Uh, And we don't want to do that because that gives the devil a foothold. And you know what happens when the door gets opened a crack, right? It gets opened farther and farther and farther. Uh, And we don't want that to happen. So it's a great reminder for us too. And especially when we understand that it was a choice they were making, refusing to believe. So the next time you come across something in scripture or the next time you experience something in your Christian walk and you're tempted to doubt the faithful character of the living God, remember that passage and and say to yourself, the book of James says, when you pray, believe and don't doubt. Because if you believe and doubt, you're like a wave on the sea going this way and that and getting nowhere. Believe and don't doubt. God has heard this. He might do what I've asked him to. If he doesn't, he'll do what's best. So I got nothing to worry about, do I? And take that approach, remembering God's character and faithful nature. Uh, and, and that'll be a blessing for you too. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So the comment was back in uh, chapter 15, verse 35, uh, where Jesus cries, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and the response is, some heard this, said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Yeah, there was a cultural expectation. Elijah was like their, their superhero prophet from the Old Testament. And there was a cultural expectation that he would somehow reappear at significant times in their history when things were dire and he was really needed. When what the Old Testament had really promised was that there would be a type of Elijah, someone that Elijah prefigured who would come and pave the way for the Messiah. And the Gospels make it clear that that was John who preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the commentator in your Bible is being much more kind than I was <laughs> uh, in, in giving them the benefit of the doubt again and saying they misunderstood what Jesus was saying, thinking he was calling Elijah. Possible. Uh, I still personally kind of think because of the context here that they were just making fun of Jesus some more because Eloi in Hebrew and, and Elijah in Hebrew sound very much alike. I think they were making a pun and saying, oh, he's calling Elijah. Dire, well, maybe, maybe that fits. Dire circumstances. Elijah will come and help him now and kind of ridiculing him in that way. But in any case, they were missing the point of that prophecy that John had fulfilled it. And, and of course, I'm misunderstanding what Jesus said for sure. Yeah, good comment. Anything else? Well, okay, we're at the end of the book of Mark. I was wondering, since we've been talking a lot about it, if as we continue to meet in the weeks ahead, we just jump into the story of the early church, the history of the early church in the book of Acts. Uh, we haven't done that in a long, long time. And I think it would, because again, we've been kind of leading up to it, going through a couple of the gospels now, John and Mark, it would be kind of an appropriate place to go next. So unless there's any objections, who's going to object to studying a certain book in God's word, right? <laughs> there's nothing that anybody had a really burning desire to look into next. Don't say revelation, okay? I'm sorry? Where are we going next? Is that what you're asking? I was thinking of the book of Acts. Yeah, just continue with the account of the early church next. Okay, but until then, let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you. We've seen ample evidence of your faithfulness once again today, of who you are, as Jesus went resolutely to the cross for us. Uh, human beings sometimes go part way, some of the way, sometimes don't try hard at all. But the Savior was willing to do all things necessary that we could know you and have life. So help us now to be the continuation of what happened in the book of Acts, the continued history of your church on this earth until that day when Christ returns and we all see you face to face. We pray your blessing upon that, that we would know you and make you known. We ask it in our Savior's name. Amen.
Hands had a hold on me But the son who died to save us Rose that we would be free we're often as overwhelmed by the idea of having big faith conversations with our kids as I am by the task of keeping a clean house. We have a rough idea of how our spiritual house should look, but we feel we've let things get messier than they should be. We know we should have more faith conversations than we do. The ones we do have don't go quite as well as we'd like. And then discouragement sets in when we don't feel equipped to answer the questions that our kids raise. Well, it's important to know that research consistently shows that at least 60% of kids who grow up in a Christian home walk away from Christianity by their early 20s, largely in response to intellectual challenges to their faith. However, these subjects often aren't taught in detail in Sunday school classes or youth groups, if they're taught at all. This means our kids need some very specific preparation for what they'll encounter today, and they need that preparation from you. In the book, you'll find a step-by-step -step guide at the end of every chapter with questions designed to help you facilitate conversation with your child about the chapter subject. In this video series, we'll use a portion of those questions to look at some practical ways to transform the content into dialogue in your home. Remember that homes where deep and meaningful faith conversations happen regularly are not the product of lucky parents. They're the product of intentional parents who believe nothing is more important than raising kids to know and love Jesus. All those sports events, music practices, play rehearsals, and other activities that fill our weeks can be great, but Jesus must come first. <laughs>